words. All right. So I, I feel like I check it pretty obsessively. But my apologies. Wednesday's video is on mute. <laughs> but that's from Wednesday. So that's like strike three from Wednesday. And then I have a clear slate today, right? <laughs> yeah. Three a week? I'm going to need more. I think. <laughs> so my apologies there. I haven't forgotten to record yet this term, but that can also happen. So not to jinx it or anything. All right. Uh, I was also checking to see if I had posted an assignment for 1.3, but then I noticed I hadn't posted one for 1.2 either. Wow, just, <laughs> just, just really nail down 1.1. So I'll, I'll post assignments for those, but you'll have a week to to do them from the time that I post them. So uh, not to worry, um, but all right. Um, were there any other housekeeping things to talk about? I don't think so besides that. So a little bit of review, <clears throat> not too much. We finished uh, 1.3 last day which is on average rate of change, which is really just going to be the change in Y, right? The change in output, so Y2 minus Y1 over the change in input, X2 minus X1, okay? Or in terms of functions, F of X2 minus f of x1 divided by x2 minus x1. And that's how we find the average rate of change between two points. Oh, it's all coming back to me. No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I tasked you with something. I did. I said, yeah, do this crazy, crazy little guy here. Quite lengthy, but then I posted it with the notes, right? And so it's in the notes and I, I do encourage you to try it, right? We built up to that. And I also filled in um, the first two that we skipped because I considered them too easy, right? But just make sure that you've got those uh, A and B, which I added in here yeah. and then i also tacked on this last one the general average rate of change for a function between a and a plus h of course it's function dependent right but what's going to happen uh always is that this h in the denominator is going to cancel and so uh, if it doesn't end up canceling, then you've probably done something wrong. And then I, I, because I was just writing on my own, got carried away and did a little description there. Uh, they're just from the, from September 20th. I just threw them in with the, so they're not separate. They're just in. I have, uh, and I even put a little note. Okay. Sorry, the video's on mute. Unbelievable. All right. So that's all we're going to do in terms of review because we're not really going to touch on it explicitly, we're going to work with putting things into functions and manipulating functions today uh, with composition of functions. So section 1.4, it's called function composition or compositions of functions. 
this is important. How about I just snag this? It's not important, but I want to be consistent. So section 1.4, composition of functions. Function composition is when we have two functions and we can see how they relate to each other by taking the output of one and using it as the input in the other function. Okay. And so um, let's start with a little definition box, introduce some notation, all that fun stuff. Whoops. Okay. So when the output of one function is used as the input of another, okay, we call the entire operation a, a composition of functions, right? We kind of put them together and see how they act together. So we write f of g of x, right? So notice when you see these brackets, you're going to write, say, of, right? So f of g of x, okay, which is read f of g of x. Uh, or if you want to emphasize that it's a composition, you can say F composed with G at X, right? So F takes the input G of X. Okay. Fancier notation is an uh, open dot for the composition. Okay. So the composition operator, which you can write like this. So F of g of x so here or f is composed with but i just read it as of so f of g of x okay, or f composed with g at x is what it technically says but um however you want to remember that. So what that's saying is that G is going into F, right? Versus, versus what? Versus, oops, open dot. If we have this, now F of X is going into G of X, right? So here, this is G composed with f at x, right? Or g of f of x. Okay, so the order matters here. Order matters. Pardon? Oh, uh, we can do either or, but uh, just reading them and how the output, the final output will be very different. Yeah. Yeah, maybe versus, how about I write or instead? Or, no, that makes it sound like they're the same and that's not true. There. Oh, well, there's a great question. What a great segue. Let's have a look here. Where's the example I wanted? Piecewise functions. Okay. I'll snag this. If we let the function b of t be the number of bushels of apples produced by t trees, just looking at that function alone, right, t is the input, so I tell it how many trees I have, and then I get the output, the number of bushels of apples that I'm expecting to get out of those trees, right? So just on its own, that's a function. 
right? And so here, the input is T trees, and the output is the number of bushels. Uh, it's, a, it's a unit of measurement. I feel like a bushel is quite large, but I actually don't know. Yeah. Is a bushel, is it like, uh, you know, those big picking baskets that they have? I feel those white BC produce boxes. Is that a bushel? Hey, what happened? Uh oh. I said the bushel is 38 to 42 pounds. Thank you. Uh, 40, what was it? 38 to 42. 38 to, I just had to keep writing, I guess, to 42 pounds. So it's quite, quite large. Um, but it's just, it's just units and very interesting that I've never thought to, I've never paused there. I'm like, bushels, got it. But that's weird of me. Um, but then, right, if you go and sell those bushels of apples, right, some unit of apples, then you get some profit, right? So you can give it some number of trees figure out how many bushels you're expecting, and then take that and use it as the input to figure out how much profit you're expecting, right? It's kind of this uh, chain reaction, right? And so then the second, so this is for the function B of T, but then, and maybe I'll underline here, I'll match it color-wise. So now for P of B, we have the input is the number of bushels and the output is the profit in dollars, presumably, but whatever. When I first read this, this doesn't make sense. But if you, which has meaning, B of P of 10 or P of B of 10? Tricky because P and B sound the same, right? <laughs> you can just kind of uh, slur it a little bit and I'll be like, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah the profit of the bushels of 10 trees, right? Whereas if we read this one, right, it would be the number of bushels for the profit of 10 bushels, right? Because the input for P is the number of bushels, right? And so now you're finding the output in bushels, taking the input in bushels, getting the profit, and then getting the bushels, which doesn't make sense. And bushels is turning into a funnier word by the minute. The more I say it, the more I'm starting to, is that a real word? Bushels. So here, this one's the, the real one, right? Because this one says, um, the prop find the bushels of the profit from 10 bushels. Doesn't make sense. Yeah, bushels. Whereas this one that we wanted We have to interpret what it means. This is find the profit uh, 
from the number of bushels produced by 10 trees. Now, I'm a slave to the page break. Bushels produced by 10 trees. There. Nice. Okay. What if we have the functions given as tables, right? There's lots of different ways that we can communicate functions and Often just seeing them with tables is nice because then we can we can map them and we're limited to the number of inputs and outputs, which is really nice. So if we have these two functions, right, f of x and g of x, right, each of them takes some input, right, of x. Okay? And what we can do is we can compose all these different functions, right? And so what's important is that you start with the inside, find the output, and then use that output as the input for the outside function. It's harder to say than to do, I think, right? And so what does this look like? Step number one, A. We want to find g of f of 7. Okay. Step one, find f of 7. Okay. f means that, OK, well, obviously, I want to have this function. Later, I'll be using g, right? So f limits me to this table. And if I give it an input of 7, I get an output of 6. And so here, so here I'm saying, okay, we give it an input of seven and then we go to the table, which tells us that the output is going to be six. Now you blur the F of seven out and you replace it with a six. Right. And so now G of F of seven, oops, that doesn't look like a seven, is the same as G of six, right? G of six links us over here, right? So now I'm in the G function and I give it an input of six and I get an output of 10. Whoo! So you wanna keep your head on straight for these, right? And really work methodically. Don't trip yourself up. That's easy for me to say. I was running late this morning and I got to the office and I said to Steve, I was like, oh, doing compositions today. I really should have worked out these, uh, these examples before I go into class and do them on a whim because they, they trip me up. Uh, so I'm trying to be, well, these are, are fine. Later, they trip me up and you'll see. So that's not a strike because I, I already declared it. It wouldn't be a strike. It's not going to happen. Maybe. No guarantees. OK. Same thing, right? Starting in the, on the inside here, right? find the output of f at 5, right? I stopped with the steps, I realized. Step one, step two. We're doing the same thing, but I'm gonna try to explain it 
in words instead, right? This, this action looks the same as this, right? Just at five instead of seven, okay? So in words, find the uh, output of f or f of x when x is equal to five. Then use that output as the input in G of X. In words, that's what we're doing. So if we have G of F of five, start in the inside, right? So F of five, okay, just focus there. Then I have f of x is the output. The input that I want is five. So then the output is two, all right? So let's start there. G of two. Okay. Now we take that two as the input into g. So x is two, the output is three. In the end, right, this is as much work as I would expect to see, right? And so it's really just about uh, mapping them back and forth. So is this something we can plot on like graphs or? Uh, or they would be two this? separate graphs. Okay. And we do have an example like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, Let's see here. What's another way, just because it's not on here, another way that I could write this is G of F at seven. Or I could write, just so we're able to recognize this notation as well, G composed at F at five. How about C, F of G at two? All right, so in terms of composition notation, this would be written as F composed with G at two. Because right. I expect you to be able to read this as well, so it's helpful to see it right away. But this is cleaner, I think easier to work with. Okay, we've got a mix up of the functions. That's okay, we can do that, right? Just focus on the inside. And so now we have, I'll just rewrite it out, f of g at two, starting at g of two. So now the input is x is equal to two. So the output is three, right? So now I replace G of two with three, which is F of three. Now the input for F is three and we'll get the final output of seven. Ta-da! Nice. Let's get wild. F of F of three. Wow. Now we're looping onto ourselves. We can do that, right? And so just get whiplash. Wait. We can find F composed with F at three. Okay. So F of F at three, just keep your cool. I can see from here that F of three is seven, 
but let's go back to the table, right? So I give it three and I find three, give it, find the output of seven. Since we're looping back into F, now the input is seven, so the output is six, right? So here we want to find the F of seven, which is six. Okay. Think of these tables as, okay, if you have these number of trees, for example, right, here's the number of bushels, and then you can use these number of bushels, which don't match, but you get the idea, to get the profit, right? But it's the same sort of relationship. This one? Yeah. Okay, so we're allowed to make compositions of the same function. So here we're taking the output of F at three and then using that as the input into F again. Yeah. Same thing, you just gotta keep your cool. All right. What if we have graphs instead? Functions can be tables, functions can be communicated as graphs, or functions can be in terms of function notation, obviously, but we're building up to that. Okay. So first thing I want you to notice is that this is the graph for K of X, and this is the graph for M of X. Okay. Given some graph, we can give it an input, get an approximate output. My guess is that these are gonna be nice and clean mapping, right? I hope, right? I don't wanna be using approximations, that's tricky. We can, but it's, I don't know. Um, I don't like it. Have you guys seen Unstable on Netflix? There's this really funny scene where one of the scientists, she goes, oh, I hate, I hate approximations. I think approximations are the new smoking, <laughs> which really, yeah, stuck with me. We don't like approximations, no. Okay, so what does this say? Take the output at uh, when X is one for K, right? Same deal, but now we, we're given the information in a different way. So I have, let's see here, k at x equal to one. I'm gonna say k of one is two, right? So I'm gonna say k of one is two. Now I'm going to take that two, right? So here, and let's just ignore these for now. I'll do a, a separate one for, for those. Copy pasta. Okay, so now I have M of K at one is the same thing as M of two, right? From the graph. So now I take that input of two, x equals two, and I get the output that m of two is equal to negative one. How am I doing for, oh boy. Time flies when it's Friday morning. I'll do this. 
copy, paste. But what I want to do is just go back and I'll fill in those two, B and C, because I want to go to D, which is, I mean, they're all the same at this point, but maybe not to you yet. So we're doing D. I'll fill it in so it'll be in the notes, but uh, try them on your own. K of M at negative one. So now I have an input of negative one into M. So I'm gonna take an input of negative one and then I find that M at negative one is equal to two. So K of M at negative one is the same as k at 2. k at 2, womp womp. Give it 2. Why is it womp womp? It's just 0. That's fine. It's just so boring. Right? So you can flip flop between these two. This is just working up to working with functions, and that's why I kind of had to accelerate things a little bit, right? So now let's kick it into high gear and actually use some, hey, come on, some functions to evaluate these compositions. So we're given some function, which is f of p. So it takes some input p and returns 2p minus p squared. So if I want to find f of b, what do I have to do? Back to basics here. Well, now my input is b instead of p. That's fine. I just rewrite all my p's as b's, and then I'm done. Right, wherever I see a P, I'm going to write B. Right? So here, this becomes 2B minus B squared. Right, uh, P turns into B because that's the input, right? told that the input is B now, that doesn't give us a number, but that's okay. Right. Using that same idea, right? F of three X plus one, right? Now you're just gonna use that three X plus one as one entity, right? And wherever you see a P, you're gonna rewrite three X plus one, right? So use brackets around that three X plus one, just to, to emphasize to your brain that this is one thing that I'm putting in there. Okay. So this is going to be two times three X plus one minus three X plus one squared. Okay. Let's expand this. Why not, right? Simplify it a little bit. Okay, so I have to multiply this two inside, but then I also have to expand the three X plus one times three X plus one, right? And so here this becomes six X plus two minus, and then I'm gonna keep it in brackets for a little bit. And I like to visualize it three X plus one times three X plus one. That's also a reminder to me that this is not, I can't just bring this power inside. I can only do that if I'm only multiplying or dividing inside, right? I'm not allowed to do it when I'm adding or subtracting, okay? And so here I just rewrite it out like this 
And yes, it takes longer, but I like to just kind of work through the steps and that's for my own. Uh, I'll snag this, copy, paste, and then I'll do this. Huh? So I've already simplified 6x plus 2 and then minus, and now I'm going to have 3x times 3x plus 3x times 1 plus 1 times 3x plus 1 times 1. So I get whoo, 9x squared, right, plus 3x plus 3x plus 1. I can simplify that, so I get 6x plus 2. Going to get a little bit wild here. I'm going to bring in this negative, as well as combine like terms of 3x plus 3x, making 6x. All right, so I'm going to do that all in one go. And I get 9x squared minus 6x, right? 3x plus 3x makes 6x. but then subtract it and then minus one. Okay. Six X minus six X. Well, we don't have to deal with those anymore because they cancel. And then two minus one is going to put me at one. And so I'm left with negative nine X squared, being sure to keep that negative, right? That's important. So negative nine X squared plus one, right? Two minus one. Okay, good. A little bit tricksy, right? But just kind of work each, each step and don't get overwhelmed. That's easy for me to say. Okay, so now, what if we have f of root of p? So now, wherever I see uh, a p, right, I'm going to replace it with the root of p and see what happens. So I get 2 root p minus root p squared, is that? Throw those in brackets just because I I find it helps me kind of see what's going on. And so I get two root P, nothing changes there, but what's nice is that square is going to cancel the square root, right? And I'm left with just minus P. Being really sure to not make it look like it's under the square root because it's not. Right, and so what I like to do is just kind of cap that square root, right? Just to visualize that that square root ends there, and then minus p. All right. Okay. Nice. Trying to check the time. Okay, what if we have, put it on a fresh page here. What if we're given functions, g of p is one over p and f of p is the root of p. Now, if I have to find f of g of p, starting on the inside, right now I don't have any outputs but now I'm just going to find the outputs and use it as the inputs, which is exactly what we were doing. It's just a little bit sneakier because we don't have values anymore. So f of g of p, starting on the inside, right? We focus on g of p. Well, g of p is 1 over p, right? And so this... Right, g of p 
is, so we want F of one over P. So the function that we want to apply is F, but instead of P, now I want to rewrite the P's as one over P, right? My input is one over P. And so here, what I get is I get use one over P as the input. So then I get the square root of one over P, right? Instead of P, I write one over P. can bring the square roots inside, but let's just leave it like that. I think that's fine. What about G of F of P? So now I'm taking F and putting it into G. All right. Earlier I was taking G and putting it into F, that's fine. We can work both ways. We're gonna get different functions though. G of F of P, all right, g of f of p, starting with f of p is the root of p, All right? So what I want is g of root p. So I want g of the root of p. g, takes the input and turns it into one over the input, right? So G takes the input of root P and turns it into one over root P. Okay, fine. In this case, they're the same, but that's weird. It's not usually the case. Why are they the same? Because I'm dividing here. I'm allowed to take this root and break it up over the numerator and denominator. The square root of one is one, and the square root of P is the square root of P. So I'll, I'll add that here, which is the square root of one over the square root of P, which is one over root P. I feel like that's, I guess that's the reason I should have worked it out before because that's confusing. I just said, this is never the case. They never are, they're very rarely the same and they are very rarely the same, but oh well, that's what I get. What if, uh, <laughs> You're warmed up now. I never find your examples in the text. Oh, they're uh, they're posted on Moodle, and it just says Chapter One Examples. Oh, oh. but they are from the text. Yeah, I uh, they might not be in the textbook, but they're provided by the author. I'm stealing them. They're good though. Um, yeah, they're probably in the textbook or at least similar, but on Moodle there should be, oh, it's even a, a PowerPoint so that you can copy, copy paste if you wanted to. Okay. Woo. What if we have, so we're told that F of G of X is four, right? Let's just read it out first, that's hard. Four times the third root of X squared plus five. And then here I would emphasize that that's the end of the root by putting a little Kind of grouping on there and then minus two 
There are different ways, so different functions. So find possible functions for f of x and g of x. And there's lots of different options, okay? Uh, but being able to kind of pick functions apart like this is gonna be really useful. And so here we go. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. So g of x is on the inside, all right? So the inside function was put into the outside function, right? So what if I let, uh, well, I've got a few options. What could I, what's the most obvious option? What if I let x squared plus five be g of x, right? Then, so let's say let g of x, which is going into f of x, let g of x be x squared plus five. what would f of x have to be, right? Then f of x must be well, the input that I gave it was x squared plus 5 and I have to end up here. So that puts me at 4 times the third root of x minus 2. Four times the third root of x minus two. What's another option? Yeah, g of x is just being the third root of x squared plus five. Nice. Four x, x minus two. Awesome. Yeah, that simplifies f of x, right? Because then now. This whole thing is just x for g of x, or sorry, f of x rather. So then I have four times x minus two. And or, and there are lots of other things that you can, uh, can do, but those are the two obvious ones, right? You can get weird with it. Right, what could you do? You could do, uh... no, never mind. Are, Let's are not. There rules for like how simple you can make it? Well, I mean, if you wanted to, an option is to let g of x be x. Yeah. <laughs> and then f of x is just four times the third root of x squared plus five minus two. That's an option. That's, that's legit. Uh, it doesn't help you much in terms of kind of teasing things apart, but it, it's absolutely an option, right? And so, um, awesome, nice. I feel like I'm, I've got this internal clock, I'm out of time. And also a clock on the wall that I refuse to read. Um, <laughs> blink and you miss it on Fridays. That's good. Function composition, we still have to talk about the domain of composed functions, but we'll leave that for Monday. Nice warm up. Uh, any questions? Have a great weekend and I'll see you on the other side. I'll stop this here.